But it's not just singing. It's not singing like you would sing in the shower, or how you would perform a gig, or even if you were to sing an opera, or even a musical. It's not that kind of singing. You put a lot of work in dedicating your lives to preparing the music that you sing in the choir. But the singing that you do in the choir is not the end or the goal of what you're doing. The singing is actually the means to the end. And the end is the offering of sacrifice to God in the liturgy. That's the reason why you're singing. And so ultimately you're not just singing. You're offering glory to God. The choir is an integral part of a sung liturgy. It's an essential part of a sung liturgy. Now, there, there's different sung liturgies, and, and the choir is necessary for all of them. So in, in the extraordinary form of the Mass, those of you who are familiar with it, there's different forms of offering the Mass. So you have, first of all, you have a low Mass, which is usually a priest and one or two servers, and the whole thing's recited. And most of the time it's just you attend it silently, kneeling in your pew and, and following along the prayers in your missing. Then you can have a low mass with hymns. You see this frequently, for example, in Mexico, a lot of times they do this even during the week, that you'll have a low mass and the priest doing the responses with the server, but then during the offertory and after communion, people will sing a hymn. Well, sometimes you'll have a low mass again, the priest and the server, and, and oftentimes this type of low mass, the priest and the servers do the responses rather quietly, but at the same time you'll have the organ playing, This you kind of see in France frequently, sometimes even uh, funerals they do this way, that the priest is up there uh, celebrating the mass in a silent voice or in a quieter voice, and the organ is playing in the background. And sometimes, in some parts of the world, they'll, they'll do the opposite of what you would think. So at the consecration of the Mass, when you would think it was supposed to be quiet, they'll be playing the organ even louder and, and more dramatically. Um, that's just what they do. Then you have a sung Mass. Now, a sung Mass would be uh, a priest, one or two servers, and then you have all the parts of the Mass sung. So even the priest will sing the Epistle and the Gospel and the readings and, and the intro and all that. All the part, all the Mass would be sung as if it were a high Mass, except it would just have one or two servers. And it would just be the, the liturgy, the, the ceremonies would just be like a low Mass. And of course you have the high Mass. And oftentimes you'll have incense at a high Mass. Interestingly enough, that was something introduced since 1962. So before 1962, you usually didn't have incense at a high mass. It was usually only at a solemn mass with an indult for a high mass. However, with so few priests being able to do a solemn mass, it was more broadly permitted that incense would be allowed at every high mass. And then you have a solemn mass. Solemn mass is when you have all the service, but you also have a deacon and a subdeacon. So it looks like you've got three priests up there celebrating Mass, but actually one is a priest, one is acting as if you were a deacon, which he is, because if you're a priest, you're also a deacon. And then the other one is acting as a subdeacon. Then you have Pontifical Mass. Now, Pontifical Mass is this confusion incarnate. You've got deacons and other priests and servers and coat people and all sorts of stuff all over the place. And the idea is that it's a bishop coming to celebrate Mass. And then you've got a papal Mass, which in today's culture, or not so much today's culture, but at this point in history, it's literally impossible to do. You need to have servants, and you need to have uh, almsgivers, and you need 
to have all so you have to have cardinal serving the mass. It's kind of insane. And supposedly there was only one written manuscript on how to do it, and it's being stolen by I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so that's your that's your papal mass. But out of all the different kinds of masses that are available, only the low mass, only the recited low mass is done without a choir. All the other kinds of masses, you need to have a choir in order to have that mass. Or maybe a solo, a solo choir, either one. But you can even have a mass with fewer altar servers that still need the choir. So a sun mass, you only have, you only need one or two altar servers, but you still have the choir. So the choir is a necessary part of the liturgy. And so, like I was saying, to sing in the choir is to take an active role in offering the sacrifice of the Mass. And I'm specifically using the word sacrifice. As you know, the Mass is a sacrifice. <coughs> the liturgy is the work of giving worship to God by participating in the sacrifice of our Savior that he offers to his Father. In other words, every time we go to Mass, it is a representation of Calvary, where our Lord offers himself and is immolated and offers himself to the Father in sacrifice. It's kind of an opening into the life of the Trinity that we're about to participate in. It's a very beautiful opportunity to, to see the very life of God. So you've got God the Son offering Himself to God the Father, and God the Holy Ghost bestows all these graces and blessings on us, um, and we're allowed to be part of this. Not only are we allowed to be part of it, but we are offering this sacrifice with our Lord as members of the mystical body. And, and in the choir, you're, you're taking, like I say, an active role in this, a necessary, integral part of this. And because it is this very close union with God, everything that is used for Mass is sacred. So holiness is, is kind of a union with God. And so being this close to God, this close interaction with the, with the Trinity, everything used for Mass is sacred. That's why we have an altar rail that divides us, uh, divides the sanctuary from the rest of the church. And we have a church which is divided from the rest of the world. Um, whenever you drive by a church on the street, you usually make a sign of the cross. You're, you're passing a spot on earth which is different than the 7-Eleven or, or the Target. This is, this is a sacred, sacred spot. And everything that is used for the liturgy is, is set apart. It's not worldly. And there's a phrase for that. It's not profane. It's not used for common things. So you don't see the priest walking around the street uh, in the vestments that he wears for Mass. That those things are just used for Mass. And you don't drink random stuff out of the chalice of mass. This is just used for mass. And the patent that goes under your chin at Holy Communion, that's just used for that. It's not used for anything else. Um, the cruets are just used for mass. Everything on the altar is just used for mass. So, so they're set apart from worldly things. They're, they're not worldly. But at the same time, they need to be of high quality. It doesn't, suffi doesn't suffice to have a plastic cup that you've just put aside and I'm just going to use this plastic cup for mass. Uh, if you did that, it would, it would be horrible. Even though you're only reserving it for mass, and you're spending it, and you're only doing that, but it's cheap, it's plastic, it's junk. I mean, why would you, why would you even do that? Um, 
So there has to be a, a level of high quality. So the chalice has to be made out of, uh, theoretically, it should be made out of silver and then plated in gold. The reason why it's not made of, out of pure gold is because gold bends very easily, so it wouldn't last very long. Um, the, the candles, theoretically, should be pure wax. The altar pots, theoretically, should be pure linen. The vestments, the pre squares, theoretically, should be pure silk. Uh, the flowers should be real, real flowers. They should be cut, they should be destined to die. All these things at Mass are pure, they're, they're good, they're perfect. And the reason why is because it, there's two levels of uh, the merit that we can get from Mass. There's what they call ex opere operato, the, the action itself, and then the ex opere operantis, which is how you do that action. So you can do the Mass however, and there's like a baseline of, of graces and merits that you get from the Mass. And then, depending on how well you do the Mass, that's how much more graces and merits and blessings you get from God because you've done it extra well. And so everything plays into this. The quality of the vestments, how well the choir sings, how well the altar service serve, um, how much you prepare before you've come to Mass. All these things increase uh, the glory given to God, increase how pleasing God is with the Mass, and increases how many blessings we get from that. A great example of this is, is in Genesis, I think it's chapter 3. Cain and Abel, they both offered sacrifice to God, but God was not very happy with one and was very happy with the other. They both offered sacrifice. It was both offered to God. But one was the best he had, and the other was just whatever. And you see that difference there. Didn't end up very nice for one of these guys. Um, so, so the better you do this, the more pleasing it is to God and the more merit we get. So, from everything that I've said so far, I'm going to cut to the chase. You have to be holy. So if you're going to be an integral part of the liturgy, and if it is a separation from worldliness, separation from the profane, and if opere operantis makes a difference in worship, then you have to be holy. Gregorian chant is truly a marvel. I remember my first class in Gregorian chant in the seminary, uh, the professor who gave it, he put on two recordings of Gregorian chant. And if I remember correctly, it was even the same verse that was sung. And one sounded very good, and the other one didn't sound so good. And then he went on to, to explain in the class the difference. The thing with Gregorian chant is that it, it's simple. It's square notes, and they go up and down, and some are longer and some are shorter. But it's not that simple, because Gregorian chant is, is pure. And there's something about pure things that they make impurities stand out. Some of you know the car that I drive. Um, it's electric, and it doesn't have air conditioning, so I wind down the windows. One thing about that car is that you start to smell everything. Like, I can smell fresh bread while I'm driving past a bread shop. Or I can smell, well, I can smell weed on the highway sometimes. <laughs> I mean, someone else driving has to be smoking this. There's no houses around, it's a highway. Um, or I can smell oil, and I know it's not me because I don't have oil on my car, so it must be another car that's breaking down around me. Um, you can smell absolutely everything. It's quite a phenomenon because you don't have that usual gas engine, and um, 
it's like a pure, you can, you can notice the difference. Gregorian chanted is somewhat like that, that it's pure. And you can tell by the way it is sung, if it is sung by holy people, or if it is sung by whoever. Or you can tell the difference of if it is sung by a choir where there is charity, and especially fraternal charity, where they like each other, or if it is sung by a choir that's fighting among themselves. You can tell the difference because it is so pure that it shows. And that is why oftentimes you can tell the difference just by listening to the recording of if that Gregorian chant was sung by a very holy monastery or if it was sung by, I don't know, like a Hollywood production. You can tell that difference right away. Um, it, it's a beautiful marvel about chant. So if you want to sing Gregorian chant well, you really need to be holy. You really need to have that fraternal charity among yourselves. You really need to be able to get along with everybody in the choir. But it's not just for Gregorian chant. It's because you're seeing at Holy Mass that you really need to be holy. Another side of the spectrum to basically impress upon you the same point is that God is perfection. And the closer you get to God, the less you're able to be lukewarm. You're either actively working on your holiness, or you're in great danger of becoming a material atheist. That is why you see in the news sometimes, not very many, but unfortunately very scary, great crimes committed by clergy. Stuff that other people would never even dream of doing. Because if they're that close to the sacred things and that close to holding God in their hands while they're celebrating Mass, and if they're not working on holiness, then they're basically material atheists or pure atheists. Oftentimes they'll be there, well not often because it doesn't happen very often, but you'll have the guy that says to himself, what use am I if I'm not a priest? I'll have to go work in, I don't know, McDonald's or something. I have no other career that I can do. But here, I have job security. I know I'm going to get a paycheck. I know there's always going to be people in confession. I know there's always going to be people for Mass. There's job security here, so I'll keep going through the motions even though I no longer believe in what I'm doing. And it's a very sad place to be. But it exists. And it's very real. And we don't want to go there. We don't want to have that in our world. But it's real. So this happens for priests. It happens for theologians. Oftentimes you'll have theologians that really go off the deep end. And again, it's the same thing. You get to know God so well that you cannot be lukewarm. You cannot be middle road. You're either very good or very bad. It also happens to altar servers. And it also happens to the choir. That if you're this close to the liturgy, if you're this close and this essential to the liturgy, this close to God, you have to be holy. Or else you risk just going through the motions, just singing the tunes, just doing whatever, and no longer believing no longer believing in God, you're basically a material atheist. Now, after that nice note, the problem is that it's so difficult to take care of your spiritual life in the choir. And you all know this. Usually you're practicing during times for confessions. Usually, you need to be looking for, for the next music that's going to happen during the most important parts of the Mass. 
Sometimes you have to step out during the sermon. You don't even get to hear the sermon because you, you have to uh, practice apart for the offertory or whatever it might be, or you have to go to the bathroom or take a glass of water or whatever it is. And oftentimes you have to start singing right away after communion. You have no time to make a thanksgiving at all because you receive communion and then the next thing you know you're already singing the next piece because the music's got to go on. And then you spend a lot of time preparing your music during the week or practicing the organ every day. You don't leave much time for prayer. You don't ever get much of an opportunity to, to actually attend Mass and actually attend the Mass. You're always singing. You're always up in the choir loft. You never even get a good look at the altar. Um, so you spend a lot of time preparing, yes. However, the music that you sing for Mass should actually flow from your prayer life. So that you have a close relationship with God, you're, you, you pray often, and, and kind of boiling over your prayer life, you need to sing to express your prayers to God. And so you, your, your, your song is, is a boiling over of your prayer life, as it were. So your prayer life should actually equal or be more than the time you spend practicing your music. You shouldn't really be praying more than, than what you spend in the choir. So you need to be told this because if you're not told this, you're not going to realize uh, the dangers in front of you and you need to do something about this. You need to actually actively work on being holy. You need to take the time, you need to do the work to make that difference in your life. So first of all, you need to go to confession frequently. Now usually they say that once a month confession is pretty good. Um, some people say that every two weeks is a good time for, for confession. Maybe that's what I tell other people, but for you, I would say every week you should go to confession. Because if you go every week, you don't forget. Was it one week? Was it two weeks? Was it three weeks? Was it five months? When was the last time you went to confession? If you know that every Tuesday you're going to go to confession during your lunch break at the cathedral, then you know, okay, it's Tuesday, I'm going to go to confession. You're going to have to find other times to go to confession. Because as you know, the usual confession times are when you're in choir rehearsal, right before Mass or, or whatever it is. So you need to find some parish near you that has confessions at a different time during the week. You just go there, just do it. Most of the time there's not that many people in line for confession anyway, so you can just show up at a parish, go into the confessional, come out. Um, if you do that, don't do what I did the other day. So I go to confession in this parish and everybody's lined up to the one confessional and there's this other priest over here. And I'm thinking, well, I haven't got much time so I'll just go to this guy. Yeah, he read me the riot act. And um, I'm in there going to confession, confessing whatever it was, the little thing I did. And I'm thinking to myself, come on, I'm easy with everybody in the confessional and you're killing me here. It's like, <laughs> I wanted to hear his confession. <laughs> So if there's two lines and one's really long, stay in the long one. <laughs> You've got to do daily prayer as well. So do a little prayer in the morning, a little prayer in the night. Treat it like your parentheses of the day. So if you start the day right and you end the day right, whatever happens in the middle is going to be okay. Um, and try to get your rosary in every day too. Maybe it might be a question of doing the rosary when you're in the car. I don't know how the traffic is wherever you live. Here in Los Angeles, you can usually finish a rosary by the time you get to the main street. There's so much traffic. <laughs> so, so get a rosary in. Your family life 
should really be a model. So if you have a family, the rest of the parish should be able to look to your family as the family of the choir director or the family of one of the members of the choir and see this is how a Catholic family should be. You should be having your meals together. You should be praying together. You should be um, going to Mass together. That should be what your family is. For heaven's sake, you should be married in the church if you're going to be in the choir. Why would you go to a civil marriage if that's what you do? I mean, you sing church music. You should really have a very Catholic wedding. If you're not married yet, you should have a pure courtship. You shouldn't be like shacking up with someone if you're singing in the choir. And if you're single, you should have such a purity of life that people look at you and they see this person is a virtuous non-person. So whatever it is, your, your family life, however family situation you have, it should really be a model. It should be something that other people can look to to want to be like you, to want to be like your family. That's what your family should be like. You should have no attachment to sin. You hear this phrase, attachment to sin, whenever you hear about indulgence, it's plenary indulgence. You can only get a plenary indulgence if you have no attachment to sin. And then you have everybody asking, well, what does that mean? Attachment to sin means that you have some cobweb of sin in your soul that you don't want to get out. Either you've stolen something and you haven't given it back, or uh, you're living with someone you shouldn't be living with, or you have impure material in your closet or something that you don't want to get rid of, or um, I don't know, another example would be like pirated stuff or whatever, but that's what an attachment to sin is. It's like a lingering sin that you are supposed to take care of, and maybe you even confess in confession, but you didn't do restitution. That's what an attachment to sin is. And if you have anything like that in your life, you should get rid of it. Um, maybe it's something you want to do. You want to take a day, and you want to sit down and just want to think, is there anything that I have, is there any sin that's like lingering, that I've got some sort of like remnants of, of some sort of sin in my life? Is there something that I have that I stole that I didn't get rid of? If the person's dead that you stole it from, well then give it to a poor person or something. Um, whatever it is, just examine your conscience and, and dig down deep, see is there anything there that's still lingering in my soul. And if there is, we'll take care of it. Usually something like this is not a question of confession. Usually something like this doesn't mean, okay, now I've got to go to confession to confess this. Usually something like this is something you've confessed in the past and you just haven't done the restitution or whatever it is to make that right. And so you just got to do that. You just got to, okay, if I've still got the bike I stole when I was five years old, I've got to get rid of it. I've got to give it away to someone or, or something. That sort of thing. So you should examine your conscience and see, do you have any attachment to sin? And then the next thing you should do is a little harder, believe it or not. You should have no habitual sin. What does that mean? That means if you're in the habit of getting angry at people, you've got to break that. It's a hard thing to do to break a habit of anger. You've got to work on being humble. You've got to work on being charitable. But you can do it. And they say that the people that have conquered anger end up being uh, incredible people, incredibly charitable people incredibly neat people. Um, so yeah, whatever your, your habitual sin is, if you have a swearing habit, or if you have some other sin that is a vice that you do over and over, you've got to break that. You shouldn't have any vice in your life. They say that, well, they don't say that, 
what it, it is what it is, an altar stone. So on every altar, there's either the whole altar is, is, is a consecrated altar, which you'll see in, in permanent churches, or if it's a wooden altar, you'll have a little stone about 15 inches square made out of marble, usually. And it's got five crosses on it, and it has a relic of a saint in it. It's called an altar stone. And that's for all intended purposes, that's your altar. And it has to be consecrated by a bishop, and it takes about eight hours to do. It's, it's a huge ceremony. You've got to smear it with uh, chrism, and then you've got to build up little tents of incense on the five points, center and the four corners, and then you light those on fire. And then there's all prayers that you pray, and there's um, Gregorian water that you wash it with, and then there's um, a chapel in another part of the complex where people have been praying all night long in front of the relics of the saint that's going to go in there, and then you have to put the relic in there and seal it with a silver spatula with, with uh, the cement. You have a, a worker that comes up with suit and tie that helps the bishop seal it. Uh, he, does, he mixes the cement for the bishop. So, so it's a big deal. An altar stone is a big deal. It's not something that you just bless and put in the altar. It, it's a big deal. If you have a clueless altar stone who drops it on the floor, and if one of the corners chip off that altar stone, that altar stone loses its consecration. And it needs to be reconsecrated. A chalice, it doesn't have such a long consecration, but it, it's a specially consecrated item. If you, uh, if you replay the chalice, you can replay it with gold and no problem, you can keep using it. However, if the chalice wears out, sometimes chal chalices last many years, hundreds of years. But after a while, the, the silver on the chalice, uh, if it's a brass chalice, forget it, it lasts like 20 years. But like, something with the wine kills the brass. But like, a, a silver chalice can last <coughs> centuries. But it gets to a point where the, the metal itself gets so fragile that you'll get a little tiny hole in the bottom of the cup of the chalice. Now if you get a tiny hole in the bottom of the cup of the chalice, the chalice loses its consecration. And it has to be repaired and then it has to be re-consecrated again. So, you're getting the picture that I'm saying here. The choir is an integral part of the liturgy. And if your singing is going to have any value at all in the sight of God, then, then you've got to be holy. Not just a good person, you have to be holy. Okay, thank you, and um, we'll have Vespers pretty soon. <laughs>